In this section, we will look at how to deal with HDF5 files using Python examples. HDF5 files work like standard Python file objects. That is, it includes standard read, write, and append modes marked by R, W, and A, and it needs to be closed after use. One major difference is that it cannot be wrapped inside a with block for automatic closure. Another major difference is that there is no concept of text versus binary mode. The format includes a variety of different low-level drivers, mapping the logical HDF5 address space to different storage mechanisms. These are reached by specifying which driver to use during opening. The keywords to use for the different file drivers available to you at this time are the following. None, meaning to use the standard HDF5 driver appropriate for the current platform. Core driver, which stores the file entirely in memory, which is limited by your RAM but will be very fast. If the backing store option is true, which is the default, it saves changes to a file on disk when closing. If false, the file exists only in memory and will be discarded at closing. Family driver, which stores the file on disk as a series of fixed length chunks. This is useful if the file system doesn't allow large files. Sec2, which is an unbuffered, optimized I.O. using standard POSIX functions. STDIO, which is a buffered I.O. using functions from the STDIO library. MPIO driver, which opens a file shared across multiple processes. This is for MPI. HDF5 allows users to insert arbitrary data in a reserved space called user block, located at the beginning of the file. When a file is opened, the library looks for the HDF5 header at the beginning of the file. If it isn't there, it then reads 512 bytes and looks again for the HDF5 header. If it isn't there, it will look at position 1024 and so on in powers of 2. You can use this user block to store any data. The only restriction refers to the size of the block, powers of 2, at least 512 bytes, and that the file is closed when writing to the user block. At the very least, HDF5 allows us to store our data. This is done via the concept of dataset. Once a file is opened, we can easily store the dataset as follows, where we store a 5 by 2 matrix into our new dataset. Note that even if we've affected a NumPy array, what is being stored is an h5py.dataset instance. This is a proxy object that lets us read and write the underlying HDF5 dataset on disk. HDF5 enables slicing, allowing to access only the piece of data that you need. This is similar to how you would access NumPy arrays. For example, here, we will access the first 10 elements of our dataset. Similarly, we can access the first 10 elements of our dataset with a step of 2, meaning we will return only 5 elements. Slicing leverages the underlying subsetting capabilities of HDF5. Hence, it is very fast and efficient for large datasets. Another feature of interest is that you have control on how storage is allocated. For instance, apart from some metadata, a new dataset does not occupy any space. By default, bytes are only used on disk to hold the data you actually write. So for example, if you declare a 2TB dataset, no storage will be allocated, but we now have access to the entire storage space. Write anywhere in the big dataset that has been declared here, and only the necessary byte on disk will be used. And finally, note that HDF5 also includes compression mechanisms to save extra space if required for your dataset. For example, you can specify here that you want to use the gzip compression, and this will be applied to your dataset. In general, I imagine that you don't store all of your files in one single folder. Instead, you should store your files into organized folders, which is more efficient, even for the computer to process. HDF5 is based on a similar concept, a concept called groups. Groups can hold datasets and other groups, allowing to set an hierarchical structure, the H in HDF5, with objects organized in groups and subgroups. Groups are the container mechanisms used to organize information. As we mentioned before, groups are equivalent to Python dictionaries, where you can set a value to a specific key. In HDF5, keys are the name of the group members, 
and values are the members themselves. Group objects also contain most of the machinery, making HDF5 useful. Groups follow a path-like structure. The file object acts as the root group, marked by a slash, and is the file's entry point. Groups can be created with several ways in HDF5. The first method is to use the createGroup function, where you simply specify the name of the group. This will return a group object. You can repeat this process using the return group object to create a subgroup. A second method is to create subgroups by specifying the path at creation on the file object. Finally, you can also create a group like you would with the Python dictionary. However, note that here, the full path will be taken into account. And therefore, you can use POSIX style path to directly access objects in subgroups. HDF5, just like Unix systems, uses the concept of links. What does it mean to give an object a name in the file? Well, from our previous examples, it may seem that the name is part of the object, like dtype or shape are part of the dataset. However, there is a layer between the group object and the object that are its members. The two are related by the concept of links. HDF5 includes two types of links, hard links and soft links. In the case of hard links, objects like datasets and groups don't have a name. Instead, they have an address, or a byte of set to be precise, in the file. When assigning an object to a name within a group, the address is recorded in the group and is associated with the name we provided to form the link. Therefore, an object has as many names as there exists links pointing to it. The number of links that points to an object is recorded, and when no more links exist, the space used for the object is freed. So here's an example of a hard link. First, we create a group, as we did before. So we create the group one. Then, let's create a hard link by assigning group one to the group group two. Then, if we compare the two, we can see that they are exactly the same, and therefore hardly linked. Now for soft link. Also like the Unix file system, HDF5 groups can contain soft or symbolic links. A soft link stores the path to an object, rather than a pointer to the object itself. With H5Py, this is achieved using the function softlink. By creating a hard link, the link always points to a particular object. If we move the object around, the hard link would always point to this particular object rather than a specific location. Therefore, soft links are useful to refer to the object which resides at some particular path rather than a specific object in the file. Please note that the value of a soft link is not checked when it's created. If a link is invalid, an exception will be raised. A third type of link has been introduced in HDF5 versus 1.8. This link is called external link. An external link is similar to a soft link to an object in other files. An external link has two components, the name of a file and the absolute name of an object within that file. And here is an example of how to create an external link using the external link function. When link group is accessed, external file.htf5 is opened and the object that path to external group is returned. Groups and datasets are great for keeping data organized in a file, but the feature that really turns HDF5 into a scientific database instead of just a file format is attributes. We saw in the introduction example how easy it is to store attributes next to data. Attributes can be attached to any kind of object linked into the HDF5 tree structure, that is, groups, datasets, and even named data types. As an example, Let's create a new file containing a single dataset, which we will call dset. We can interact with dset's attributes with .attrs. Attributes assign a name to a value and are accessed like Python dictionaries. And here are examples of setting and accessing attributes.